and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? I went to Ikea on the weekend, Jason, which you know is one of my least favourite things to do. <laughs> yeah, I guess crowds of people aren't really your thing. They're not, no. Um, and crowds of people being forced through a, a maze um, is definitely not my thing. So I actually did a click and collect, which was um, much more palatable um, until I realised that then I had a bunch of um, boxes that were, you know, approaching 20 kilos each and three flights of stairs to get them up. So um, I should have really just got it delivered. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know why you keep inflicting that sort of punishment on yourself. Eh, failure to plan ahead, Jason. That's all that I can put it down to. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the rabbit maze, right? Or the rabbit maze or the rat maze. Mm. It's probably something like a psychologist would probably inflict in a research project. I well, it probably was designed by like a consumer psychologist. Yeah. The, yeah. the whole layout. I, yeah. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, and they probably had a bit of experience with um, electric shocks and that sort of thing too because it is some form of torture going to work here. I agree. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you survived. I did. I did. I Yeah, the, uh, the online um, purchasing option is definitely my preferred um, approach when it comes to IKEA. Yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad, glad that you made it through and you're able to be on the podcast today. But uh, I should probably introduce our guest for today. Yes, um, she has a PhD in English language and literature and is currently working towards a second PhD. She is a sucker for punishment yep. uh, in education from the University of Auckland, uh, where she's based. She has research interests in stress and burnout and enjoys translating her research into practical advice and training. She is the founder and CEO of Heart and Brain Works. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Georgie Toma. Yay. Thank you so much, Jason and Joelle. So lovely to be here. <clears throat> Yeah, it was so nice to meet you through LinkedIn uh, a little while ago, and then we got yeah. to chatting and uh, we figured, hey, this person actually knows what they're talking about. She'd be great to have on as a guest. Yeah, I'm super honored to be here. I'm actually a massive fan of the podcast. And at the moment, it's the only podcast that I listen to because I'm, I'm, I'm on a silence diet. So I'm, I'm introducing silence in, in my day as much as I can. And so... The time I used to spend listening to podcasts, which was when I was doing my chores or driving, is now dedicated to silence. So, yeah, yours is the only one I listen to, and it's professional okay. development. <laughs> okay, well, what are you doing next week, Georgie? You, you can come back anytime. <laughs> 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 no, gl really glad to have you on. Mm, I like uh, I like the idea of that si silence diet, but um, when you've got a seven year old, yeah, it doesn't really. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yes. not really possible. Um, I use the use, yeah. Yeah, use the podcasts and audio books to drown out the um, the other noises going on in my home most of the time. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. before you before you started this uh, this silence diet, did you have some other podcasts that you listened to other than ours? Yeah, I used to uh, I used to like listening to Sage. So Sage Publications has a podcast on um, psychology and psychiatry. So that was very interesting it was um done in a quite a an interesting way kind of making making research um available to to a larger audience making it interesting so they had interviews with different researchers so i really like that and i also used to listen to the women's hour from the bbc i used to like that quite a lot yeah fantastic yeah i'm a big yeah. big fan of um anyone that can um bring bring research to um, non-academics in a way that's understandable and um, palatable. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Um, can you tell us a bit about your professional career? Yes, um, it's been quite a, I guess, an interesting um, career that has taken me in, in different places. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from Romania and I, I lived and worked in the States, in Spain, um, in Australia and now currently um, settled in New Zealand. And so my professional career um, started off as being a teacher um, and then moving into a, a manager role still in an education sector. 
Um, and then moving into uh, the role of trainer, well, it kind of developed alongside the, the, the teaching and the managerial role was the, the, the trainer and uh, more recently founder of Heart and Brain Works and still continuing that work of one, making research available to a larger audience and then following my passion, which is um, really empowering people to understand and believe that they don't have to struggle um, on their own, that mental distress is part of life, but it is also not, not um, a destiny, right? That we can take proactive steps to improve the state of our mental well-being. So can you tell us a bit more about your company then? Uh, yeah, Heart and Brain Work. Uh, Heart and Brain Works basically was um, was born out of, um, I wouldn't say coincidence, but I guess it was born out of my personal struggle with burnout and with depression. So um, as I mentioned before, I, I, I had a management role and uh, during those years, um, gradually chronic stress became burnout and burnout became uh, depression. Depression became quite serious depression up to suicidal depression. And so during this time, I tried to, to reach out to an EAP program. I, I you know, um, tried to reach out to different sources of um, help available, but I didn't quite find something that would... Um, allow me to change the, the type of thought patterns that were making my suffering worse, that were making my stress worse. Um, and at the same time, I was, I was still operating in a work environment that was not, uh, that had, let's say, psychosocial hazards, quite significant ones, right? And so um, I reached a rock bottom and basically I had to make a choice, you know, and, and that choice was, well, uh, you know, you either do something to change your experience of life or simply this kind of experience can't go on. And so I, I, I chose the former, make a change. And so I created a program for myself, a 90 day program. And at that stage, really, it was not anything. I, it was nothing planned about the future. It was simply about survival and simply about this absolute change in, in the way I saw life and in the way I saw myself in life. Um, and Later on, I mean, after those 90 days, uh, I mean, just an incredible change had happened. Um, I made a decision. I mean, I quit my job. I quit. I quit Australia. I, I, the whole new world started. Um, and then I, I started to, to share that with others. Um, and so Heart and Brain Works started that way from that sharing. Um, and then I wanted research evidence that actually that program works and then kind of developing into understanding the greater picture around burnout, the fact that it's not an individual problem that first and foremost, it is an organizational problem. And so kind of those layers came with time. Uh, and so here we are now, heart and brain works and the research and all of that. That's, uh, that's a hell of an origin story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it, it wasn't meant to be. It was just a series of, um, I wouldn't say coincidences, but you know, life takes you places and then you just roll with it. And it, it you know, you look back and you create the narrative afterwards. But <laughs> at that time, it was definitely when, you, when you're in the middle of it, it's chaos. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's an interesting origin story. And uh, I got to say, I love the branding for Heart and Brain Works as well. You've got um, actually mm. your icon behind you for, for, your, for your business. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I do like pretty yes. things and it is quite a pretty um, It is. It's logo. A, nice, uh, a nice logo. I, yeah. I have to credit my partner. Uh, he's, he's the one. Um, that's that's his his work and he's a software developer. So it was it was just a ins moment of inspiration. <laughs> Is he looking for work? <laughs> <laughs> Always recruiting software developers at the moment. They're hard to find. Um, but hey, look, burnout's one of those terms that is being used, you know, pretty regularly now, both in the media, uh, or it's all over LinkedIn at the moment. Uh, I think there is this feeling that people are getting burnt out. Um, but I think it means different things to different people. And um, some people don't necessarily rely on a formal definition of it. What, what does the ac academic literature um, say is a definition of burnout that we can refer to? 
Yeah, I agree with you, Jason. And, and so in the academic literature, uh, probably the most uh, commonly used definition is by uh, Maslow and, and her colleagues. So Maslow is one of the pivotal researchers in the field of burnout, and she started her work uh, back in the uh, mid 70s. Um, and so her definition is actually the one that the World Health Organization adopted back in 2019 when they finally recognized burnout as an occupational hazard. And so when we look at burnout, we basically see it as a, as a symptom of chronic workplace stress unsuccessfully managed. And so when we talk about burnout, we need to take into account three dimensions. And the first dimension is that of um, initially called emotional exhaustion. But what we mean by that is that is a lack of energy, uh, physical and emotional exhaustion. The second element is uh, what is called cynicism. So cynicism um, meaning a kind of a negative attitude towards work or for those who work in the caring profession such as healthcare or, or education is a um, kind of a negative attitude towards their uh, patients or students or towards clients. And then the third aspect of it is um, low personal accomplishment um, or in other words, low efficacy on the job. So the feeling that you're not doing a good work which sometimes can actually be the case. So this, this is the definition that is used in literature and these three are the main dimensions of burnout. Yeah, so the World Health Organization obviously updated their definition in the ICD-11 uh, and made that decision back in 2019, but the new classification mm. doesn't come out until early next year, right? Mm. Yeah. Yes, but I, I mean, I would I would assume there's no changes to this because uh, the current literature still stays with the same definition. So, yeah, that's right. But I guess um, now with ICD-11, at least by um, the World Health Organization, there is that real push now. This is an occupational phenomenon, um, like you yes. say. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I agree. Mm. Yeah. No. Sorry. Go to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you about um, instruments. There's lots of instruments around there. Um, around to, to measure mm. burnout. Um, can you tell us about sort of what are some of the, the main types of tools available or what the differences are between the different types of tools? Yep. So the most commonly uh, used instrument is uh, mass loss burnout inventory, which seems to be also the most comprehensive in the sense that it measures the whole three aspects of burnout that I mentioned before. So looking at exhaustion, cynicism, and uh, personal accomplishment. But there are a couple of other instruments that are present um, as well. So we have the Oldenburg burnout inventory, which only looks um, well, it, which looks at two main things. It looks at uh, physical and emotional exhaustion. And then it um, also looks at work engagement. So kind of like how disengaged someone is from work. Um, more recently, a new instrument was developed, which was called the single item burnout inventory um it is problematic because uh this instrument has been shown in in studies to perhaps indicate levels of emotional exhaustion but not to capture the whole dimension um, of burnout and so i would caution against uh, using this as a valid measure um, and then we have the Copenhagen burnout inventory. And this is very interesting with this particular instrument because in the Copenhagen burnout inventory, we have uh, one dimension that, that measures emotional and physical um, kind of exhaustion related to personal life, then a different one related to work conditions. Um, and then on the third level, it looks at relationships, so relationships with clients. Um, so that's very interesting because um, coming back to our discussion on the fact that burnout is an organizational problem, first and foremost, I think we need to be cautious um, around using an instrument that, um, you know, has dimensions around someone's personal life. Because um, if we look at the research, um, unquestionably, the research shows us that um, the biggest factor 
in, in someone starting to experience burnout are factors really related to the organization and, and really um, psychosocial hazards present there such as workload, low support from supervisor, low reward, low control over work, and so on, right? Um, it is true, however, that there are a series of individual factors that would make someone more prone to developing uh, burnout symptoms. So it is true that there are a series of factors that allow uh, a person to be more psychologically resilient, right? And these factors have to do with uh, genetics, they have to do with um, uh, someone's um, there's been different studies with personality traits. There's been um, studies with, um, you know, someone's already ex pre-existing predispositions towards anxiety and depression. And there is um, there there are indicators that indeed certain individual characteristics would make someone um, more or less psychologically resilient. But the main issue is, however, that it is an organizational problem. So um, what do these differences tell us about the nature of burnout beyond it just being an organizational problem? Um, I think we need to take into account, for example, that um, genetic factors that predisposes uh, towards depression or anxiety, that's a factor of risk. The fact that someone's earlier life experiences, um, if, they've ha if they have been exposed to trauma, chances are they are more uh, uh, likely um, to develop burnout symptoms, for example. There's also different, um, you know, the stress profile. Um, so, for example, people with type A personality, right? People who are extremely competitive, uh, who usually um, create for themselves high pressure environments, people who are extremely perfectionistic. Uh, these are certain tendencies that definitely would make someone more prone to develop burnout. But again, they have to be uh, presented with the conditions for that to develop, which are work conditions. Yeah. And I mean, we've been highlighting that a bit already in this episode, right? Talking about this being an yeah. occupational phenomenon caused by unmanaged work related stress. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing, um, which is pretty popular um, on LinkedIn at the moment is people talking about how you can improve self-care to deal with burnout. Uh, and that's one mm. facet of it, right? But really employers yeah. have an obligation um, to do their bit in order to prevent burnout. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, th I think, look, I think it is important to talk about self-care, right? Um, I think it is important um, to have those conversations. And I guess, Part of me, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've always been an optimist, right? And so part of me sees those conversations as uh, an attempt to empower people, you know, because a lot of times, um, particularly when you look at an organizational level, there's a power differential that, that's, that's there, right? And so if you are in a position um, where you don't have control over your job, where perhaps you are being bullied by your manager, or perhaps you have absolutely no control over your workload and you don't see that workload diminishing in the near future, inevitably you will feel a sense of powerlessness, right? And so I think it is important to have conversations that would help someone understand that even in positions of less organizational power, we are not powerless, right? There are certain actions that we can do to protect our own mental health um, and then there's a series of decisions that you as an individual might have to make, which at some point might involve leaving that particular organization. But so I guess, you know, I, I hope um, that those self-care conversations are around that area, you know, allowing people to see that there are a series of things that they can do um, to help themselves right now, basically. Yeah, and, and I hope, um, you know, people who are experiencing burnout take your advice and your leadership, right? You were in a horrible situation at a, a previous employment um, role and, mm -hmm. you know, you had no choice but to leave and you made that decision, right? Um, I've spoken to mm -hmm. a number of people now who 
feel like oh, they're so burnt out and you know there's so many psychosocial hazards that aren't being managed and they brought it to the attention of their line managers and employers and HR and health and safety and even the regulator in some instances and nothing's been done yet they don't leave they continue to risk their own well-being by continuing to stay in that environment where ultimately there's lots of different jobs out there you don't have to stay uh, and work for a, a company that is not actually protecting your mental health and well-being. Yeah, I agree with you, Jason. But look, I stayed five and a half years and it took me to, to get to a really, really, really dark place, right? I understand. And I mean, fear um, is one of our core triggers, right? Um, and so uh, employment is related to safety. Right, to our ability to provide for ourselves and our family. And so it triggers a core fear response. Um, and perhaps this is where I believe, you know, the, the, that, that discussion around how you reclaim power in these positions of seeming powerlessness. And it, it really is about learning how to um, calm your nervous system, you know, your autonomous nervous system, first of all, calm so that you can mitigate that fear response and you can negotiate from a position of power or make a decision but again from a position of uh not fear but rather a calm confidence that yes i will find that job um yeah so i guess yeah. that's where some help with resilience for certain people um is useful yeah, that's the issue with the sympathetic nervous system, right? When you're in fight or flight, you're really just focused on survival and you're not being creative and thinking about all the opportunities that are available to you. And so some people might feel yeah. trapped. Whereas if they took that time, like you say, to reduce their internal stress level and re elicit the parasympathetic response, then maybe they could mm -hmm. be more creative and see their way out of a situation where they, they feel trapped. Yeah. I think there's some, um, there's, like Sorry, there's something in there around, you know, the self-efficacy um, aspect of burnout as well. You know, if you're if you're feeling like you're not actually any good at your job, um, then your willingness to actually look for other jobs is is going to be pretty low, because you, if you're lacking that self-efficacy, mm. the thought processes are going to be well nobody's going to hire me if I leave this job. I need to keep this job because you know I need to pay my mortgage and my bills and whatever else. So it's sort of, um, it's almost akin to being in like in an abusive relationship where you've lost all of your self-control and you really believe that this is the only um, option available to you. So I think that, you know, that sort of feeds into that, um, that vicious cycle as well. And then the other side of it is, um, you know, if people feel like they're working to change the system and, you know, people may have a really strong sense of um, fairness and justice and feel like they, you know, I've, I haven't been treated properly here and I want to, you know, I want that to be rectified and I want to have recognition for what's happened to me and, and all of that sort of thing. So that, that desire for, yeah, for justice, I think, can also keep people far longer than they should be staying otherwise. Yeah, you've just described someone who I know very well, who, um, yes, exactly that. Like he felt that he needed to correct the system that mm. was broken and mm. it was on him. Mm. Um, in, in the end, he did take a couple of uh, bouts of stress leave um, because, mm. yeah, it, it maybe, yeah, it, it's just that sense of justice and that, you know, greater meaning, I guess, mm. that people get from that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, certainly it's, um, it's, it's easy to say, well, why don't you just leave? Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite complex, I think, as to why people do mm. um, choose to stay in those, in those situations. Which just brings, brings us to the on. important role of the employer. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to build on what Joelle said, because it's really spot on and it's, um, there's been quite significant research done that shows that the experience of burnout is linked with low self-esteem. So it's not that low self-esteem leads to burnout. It's more like as you develop burnout symptoms, there is a decrease um, in your uh, self-esteem. And it is indeed with what you uh, linked with what you said with self-efficacy. Yeah. And so it's exactly that. You 
you lose confidence in yourself so it makes it even harder um to to take that leap yeah because you do hear that sometimes from um you know some line managers they're like if you don't like it just leave but mm. then like you say for all those reasons people might feel more afraid to leave than to stay in a an abusive relationship yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I think it's, you know, it's really easy for organisations to focus on the individual factors that contribute to burnout and to, you know, sort of um, give people the, you know, the resilience training and the, you know, the self-care assistance and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that, you know, it's a bit of a get out of jail free card, um, in my opinion, for organisations and they, you know, they need to actually be taking responsibility for what's in their control. Um, so what would you say that organisations can do to protect employees from burnout? I think it has to be a um, comprehensive solution. So what I mean by that, I think they need to take into account um, three main factors and these, these, these factors play together. And so first and foremost, they need to look at aspects of the organizational structure and we call them under the umbrella term of psychosocial hazards, but they're just, just to shed light on some of the most important issues that have been linked to uh, burnout. So first and foremost, workload. So if your employees are experiencing heavy workload over an extended period of time, even if you give them resilience training, chances are it's not going to work or there you're just really postponing the inevitable. And I think interestingly, when we talk about workload, it's important to take into account that there's different ways of looking at that, right? And so, um, workload for example um it would entail a conversation with your employees is it the amount of work you have to do or the amount of clients you have in your portfolio the amount of patients you have to look after or is it the fact that now we're working online and there's you know five zoom meetings a day where you feel like you're sometimes wasting your time the other interesting thing that research has showed is that people can actually tolerate pretty extensive workloads if they have a supportive relationship with their supervisors or, or managers. So we're looking at, for example, a, a sector like healthcare, right? And we had this pandemic, um, there are shortages, particularly in nursing. So there, it's a situation in which um, I think many of the people who work there feel kind of trapped, right? It's like, I have these patients, I need to help them, I have to help them. I can see that, for example, my organization is trying to recruit people and it just can't find them. And so in this situation, what we've seen is that an incredibly protective factor is a healthy and supportive relationship with a supervisor and a healthy and supportive relationship with coworkers. So again, in the, in the, in the factors from an organizational level, that needs to be uh, looked at. So I, I talked about workload. I talked about the relationship with a supervisor, the relationship with coworkers. Um, equally important is issues around um, how much control you have over your work, when you do it, when you take breaks. Um, the and issues around rewards. And rewards don't have to be financial, but if someone is in a position where they are underpaid. Um, and their 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 salary doesn't meet their needs that will place a stress but rewards also um are related to feeling that you've done a good job and to the fact that your work is recognized on the organizational level right <laughs> that your colleagues embrace it that your manager embraces it right so these are just some of the factors on an organizational level that need to be taken uh into account and then the second part, I do believe resilience programs are useful and they should be given by uh, companies so that companies pay for them so that employees don't have to go on their own and pay out of their own budget, you know? Um, because I do believe there's a series of skills that, so for example, just, just a short example on this, in, the, in teaching literature on burnout. So burnout has been extensively studied, particularly uh, when it comes to healthcare and teaching professions, because these have been and actually historically in the development of burnout as a as a term and research on it, they have been the most studied professions because uh, the burnout rates were the highest. 
So in teaching, for example, they've looked at this um, and Jennings and her colleagues, so Patricia Jennings is one of the biggest uh, uh, people in, in the academia that has written about this, right? And she's developed, she, she, she's taken a systems approach to burnout in teaching. And so she came up with, um, um, with um, I guess, a framework that explains that, yes, on a systemic level, uh, the issues that I just mentioned before around workload and so on, but there's also a personal level. And so she's identified a lack of what she calls social emotional uh, competencies. So it's really around um, how well a person knows how to regulate their emotions, right? Uh, that's just one example. And so she talks about the importance on, of having those social emotional competencies and she's done many, uh, and then she's done a lot of research that shows that in the absence of those competencies, what happens is what it's called a burnout cascade. So what it means is that you know a stressor comes up, um, a person engages in a maladaptive behavior, like uh, you know, for example, uh, when a, a student says something uh, that you as a teacher might perceive as you know disruptive or insulting. You don't have the emotional regulation skills to kind of calm your reaction, but rather you react in a way, you know, it's like, you, to, you know, shut up or whatever. Um, and that reaction engenders um, negative behavior, classroom disruption. So all of this, that's what she called a cascade, um, a burnout cascade. So I do believe that resilience, whether we call it resilience training or social emotional competencies, uh, I think the terms, you know, it's useful to define them, but basically the core of it is there are certain skills around emotional regulation and stress response that a lot of people don't know and that they can use. And so I believe organizations should pay for it, as I mentioned before. So that's the second thing in my first look at the organization level, then offer some resilience training, and then look at your managers. You know, what happens? Not always, but sometimes you have a person who's an expert, right, at what they do, and the organization wants to promote them, wants to keep them, wants to raise their salary. And so, okay, how do we do that? Well, we promote them to a manager level, and now they're managing people. And, you know, they're experts at what they do, and that's absolutely great, but we know that there is a whole series of communication competencies um, that need to be there in order for a relationship, a manager kind of report relationship to be healthy and successful. And so I think it is important for organizations to recognize if they've promoted a person that maybe needs help in developing those competencies and then giving them the appropriate help. So that's, that's, my, the, um, that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that that's good. Just to, to add to that last point, I think, um, you know, not everybody who is in that really, um, that, that level of competence where they're ready for a promotion, they, they don't necessarily want to go into a leadership role. You know, they really like doing their technical work and they like to be able to be an expert in what they do. So I think organisations need to have two different promotion pathways. You know, they need to have that management option but they also need to have that you know yeah promotion through into you sort of um, subject matter expertise status within the organization as well um, so that you don't have yeah. you know management as the only promotion pathway for people who really aren't interested in in management and will just end up micromanaging their teams yeah I so agree I so agree and and I think uh, another thing that and the last thing that I want to um um, address is, um, I haven't mentioned this before, but um, one of the crucial factors is uh, bullying, right? And whether this is present in the organization and whether it comes from a manager or from a coworker. So it is absolutely crucial for organizations to have some method or, or so, sorry, not method, but like system in place where they can, where, where they can actually see if that's happening or not anonymous channels where people can talk uh, because this is an absolute um, uh, it's a very serious issue yeah um, actually we've seen um, more and more discussion around incivility versus burnout right so not quite mm -hmm. reaching the um, 
he wouldn't say diagnostic criteria, reaching the def- formal definition of burnout, <laughs> but still people making it difficult. Bullying, do you mean? Yeah, bullying. Yeah, no, oh, sorry. Yeah, not meaning the definition of, of bullying, but, um, you know, making it uncomfortable for colleagues in, in the workplace. Um, yes. So, yeah, I, I think there's probably a lot more incivility because people get clever and they game the system and they go, well, I don't want to be able to be called out on bullying, but I still, you know, I'm going to make life hard these people mm. um you, you mentioned before about resilience training um that employers mm. should really you know provide to employees and i'm actually of the opinion as well like if you're not going to eliminate a psychosocial hazard uh, or all psychosocial hazards which is pretty mm. much impossible to do uh in a workplace then the very least that you should be doing is providing training on self-care and how to recognize the signs of mm. things like burnout and stress and how to, how to actually manage these effectively. Um, but what else could an employer do if employees are starting to exhibit symptoms of burnout? I think uh, in short, it would be take action immediately. Like don't wait, start taking action. And I think start by consulting your people and, and start a consultation um, not just for the sake of consulting, but with the commitment to follow through on what you find is not working well in your organization. So, I mean, you can use a survey or focus groups. I would recommend doing both, but start to understand what is putting your uh, people at risk and then be transparent about what you will do to address that. And so I, I, I recognize that in some instances, it organizations are aware of the of the psychosocial hazards present and they are not able to remove them in the short term so just one example is the short nurse nursing shortage for example mm. new zealand has has uh, uh this and not only in zealand i think many countries around the world i think it's worldwide because, yeah. yeah yeah exactly and so okay what's the knock-on effect is that those who are in the profession are going to be working long hours we know that shift work is a particularly strong trigger for um, for the development of burnout symptoms. So in this um, situation, we have a workplace where certain psychosocial hazards cannot be removed in the near future. But there are other things that an organization can do uh, that help build a culture of support. So look at how your managers talk to the people, right? Investigate that relationship and you can do training around building a community, right? Or you can see if they actually need some kind of resilience training and you can start with there, you can start there. But I think the, sorry, not start there, start with the consultation. Based on the consultation, you can see what actions you can actually do and communicate with your people. But I would say act now rather than later because the more someone experiences burnout, the more likely they are to uh, quit or yeah. the more likely they are to perform um, poorly. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think that's really good advice there, Georgie. Um, uh, you know, asking people, whether it's through a survey or a focus group, you know, what are the issues that are causing people to maybe feel more stressed or burnout than what they, they should be? Um, and then doing something about it. I, I see sometimes though, when it is really apparent, like you, the really good example of nursing and, and, and shortages of a, of a workforce. I mean, here in Perth, they're actually giving um, sign, signing bonuses basically to encourage nurses either, you know, to move here and, and work in the health system or to encourage them out of retirement uh, to try and get them in and re- like, um, like a commission <laughs> basically for uh, anyone who refers successfully refers a nurse to go and work at a hospital. You know, people are getting signing bonuses left, mm-hmm. right and centre. But um, I think sometimes the perception is by the employer, oh, we know what the issue is and we can't fix it because we can't get any more staff. Uh, and then they're like, all right, well, that's it. We're done. <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't mm-hmm. actually address the workplace stresses. But there are other things, like you say, that might be able to be addressed. If we don't ask people what those things are, then, you know, we might, feel like, well, we can't do anything about this situation. People are just going to have to tough it out. And I like the, uh, you know, the demands and resources model. And and we do focus a lot. I think companies do have an inordinate focus on supports and providing benefits, whether that's, um, 
you know, financial benefits, whether that's, um, you know, giving people access to apps or training or, or things like that. Uh, at some point, they do have to reduce demands. <laughs> they can't forget that side. Um, but we have to look at the things that we can. And, and on the measurement thing, um, I see many companies who are, you know, even I think some or the majority of companies that are doing it are probably just the early adopters of psychosocial risk assessment. And they are confusing it with the employee engagement survey. And they think, well, if we do it once a year, we've done our risk assessment, you know, that's great. But as we know, hazards can emerge very quickly and a lot can happen in a year. So if you're waiting a year to identify the hazards and if people are going to be at risk of stress and burnout, you know, you potentially could be harming a lot of people um, if, if you're having that infrequent a cadence for when you're actually collecting data. Um, and so, yeah, you know, Joel and I have been really pushing for people to collect data more regularly on, on these things, uh, even on a monthly cadence, uh, in order to both uh, identify hazards as they emerge um, and be able mm -hmm. to even come up with informal controls for it, not like a full blown psychosocial um, uh, action plan, um, but really empower uh, really quick and agile action to make sure that we're protecting people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Once a year is not enough. And um, it's different from employee engagement. I, mm. I, I, I so agree. There needs to be an awareness um, as to what the difference is. And, um, and so I agree with you, having a way of measuring it more regularly. And even in my opinion, if you put in a system in place whereby you are able to see that your managers are performing well, they're on the right track, there's, there's no bullying happened there, then you can actually use your managers as the first point of, um, not first point of contact, but kind of like the front line of noticing if something is not well, right? Because they check in with their team. And, and the, when you work with someone, you are in the best position to notice if there's some deviation from the baseline, right? And if the relationship is healthy, then there is enough trust to have a conversation about what's going on. And so I think, again, there's different ways of approaching the problem and probably coming from all three at the same time would allow a balance to be established, right? Um, but yeah, um, and, and the, the, I guess, just one final thing, it is important for the, leadership right the executive leadership to be on board and to kind of demonstrate a good example right yeah. because otherwise we have perceptions of hypocrisy or lack of trust and and trust in an organization in and fairness we've talked about it before it, they're really important factors yeah, yeah. I, I think what you say about empowering line managers uh, is so important. We know the hazards can be very different from team to team in an organisation, um, and just taking an employee engagement survey approach and going, well, look, let's identify the global factors and come up with a global level intervention or control. Well, you're not actually not going to get to the heart of the problem because you know we talk about leadership behaviours, incivility within a team. These are like personal dynamics. It might not be a global issue. It could be very um, localized to a specific mm -hmm. team. Um, so we really need line managers to be equipped to understand the psychological hazards that they need to be um, mindful of and what could they be doing at a team level to, to address these hazards very quickly versus a once a year kind of employee engagement survey. <laughs> Actually, you did say that thing, like it's important for people to understand the difference between say an employee engagement survey versus a psychosocial risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Got my own answer to that, but while we've got you here, Georgie, what what would you say <laughs> yeah. would be the difference between the two? Well, engagement. Um, when we look about when we look at the engagement, there's different ways of measuring engagement, but it's it, it is really about how motivated someone it is to do their job. And interestingly, in research on burnout for quite a well, quite a long. I wouldn't say quite a long, but there's been a a, a, a period of time in burnout research let's say history over the last 25 years, where um, there was a debate around what's the difference between burnout and just job satisfaction and employee engagement, right? And research has shown us that there is a difference. Um, first and foremost, because burnout has um, 
three dimensions. And the overlap is really in terms of um, cynicism and personal efficacy, which have a direct link with, with how satisfied someone is with their job and organization and how motivated it is to do their work, right? But psychosocial hazards look at many aspects related to work, right? So we look at workload, job demand and resources available, um, autonomy and control over someone's work, right? Uh, behaviors um, such as bullying, the relationships with managers and coworkers. So it's, it's there are more um, there are more varied factors, right? And they are of course linked with uh, job satisfaction. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. No. No. Absolutely. Like yeah. Add? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, employee engagement is really about, like you say, how motivated are people to do their jobs? Because what the company is interested in is productivity and retention. Um, whereas with the psychosocial risk assessment, we're trying to work out how stressed someone might be due to work-related factors and the impact on mm -hmm. burnout and um, you know mental illness development. Um, and so we're actually, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, they're competing kind of things, right? In one, we're trying to get people to work harder. <laughs> which can increase burnout. So in, increased employee engagement <laughs> might actually increase burnout as well. So um, they are two very different things. And I think we have to measure them in different ways as well. And Joelle and I have definitely been talking about that a bit lately. You know, we don't feel the employee perception style approach of survey, which you find commonly in employee engagement actually gets to the heart of the matter in terms of understanding psychosocial risk. We really need to start thinking about it as an occupational hygiene factor and measuring it in a similar way as well around severity, frequency, and duration of exposure rather than is workload high or low and then assuming risk. Yeah. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's the big thing is that we get, yeah, sort of a general description of work and then we make all kinds of assumptions about whether or not that's actually creating risk for people um, but we actually need to understand, you know, what's their experience of that work factor and how that interacts with you know, their individual preferences and all of that sort of thing um, before we get to a point of actually saying, all right, well, yes, this is actually a hazard for you. And now let's understand what your exposure is to that hazard and, and have a, you know, a better indication then of the level of risk that this is actually creating in the workforce. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and, and, but there's also a link between the two in the sense that um, if someone is, exposed to psychosocial hazards, it will have a uh, negative correlation with job satisfaction and engagement. Like you're very simply put, like you're not going to be happy if you're constantly in a workplace where, you know, one of those things are not working out for you. Yeah. So low, I guess, low scores on your engagement survey is probably a good indication that you do have some um, psychosocial hazards at play um, that you need to investigate further. Yeah. So can you tell us then, um, so you, you're doing, as Jason mentioned earlier, you're doing a second PhD um, and this one is, is looking at um, stress and burnout. Um, can you tell us a bit about that research and in particular the relationship between stress, burnout, well-being and mindfulness? Yeah, so my relationship uh, was based on that um, intervention that I created. It's called the Wellbeing Protocol. And so we, um, we were set up to, to work with, um, with a group of teachers. Then the pandemic hit. And um, so it was great because we are actually able to observe how that intervention affects people right in the middle of the, the first pandemic outbreak, which was last year. Um, so we, we went through the first lockdown here in New Zealand and, um, and it was great. So what we saw were were significant was so the, the, the program was uh was um we basically measured their levels of stress burnout um uh, mental well-being and uh mindfulness before the program immediately after and three months later and so we saw um statistically significant difference um on all the on all the measures and we saw that the effect was uh retained at three months follow up. Now, I would love to continue doing this research in the context of a randomized control trial, 
this time around it was not possible with 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 the pandemic and setting all of that was uh, was already quite a uh you know quite a success that i'm grateful for um but i would love to see this also done in really significant longitudinal studies these are the hardest to uh design and 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 put into practice and and we see currently in the in the literature there's very few of them but i think what's interesting um and maybe what i want to address is that i use the term mindfulness and there's been a, a a time when mindfulness was presented as the as the new panacea for everything and i myself am and have been a mindfulness practitioner for oh i, I don't even remember now how long but the interesting point is that that I was, for example, practicing a form of meditation back then when I was experiencing my burnout and depression. And in and of itself, it was not, it didn't give me enough tools to protect myself from that. And so that is why um, in this research and in the and in the well-being protocol, I take an approach to mindfulness that is more based um, on Obviously, mindfulness comes from Buddhism, right, and, 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 and an Eastern tradition that is incredibly powerful and offers us incredibly powerful tools. Uh, but there's also a growing Western tradition of studies on mindfulness, and uh, particularly the work of John Kabat-Zinn from the General Hospital of Massachusetts. And he is probably one of the pivotal um, pioneers of mindfulness in the West, and he created what is now known as uh, MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. And at that time, they would send him those patients with chronic pain that no one could help. Medication couldn't help them. They was like, they were just suffering, and they, you know, modern medicine kind of failed them. And so, through his program, uh, through the MBSR program, those people got reduction in pain, got improvements in immune system. So there's hundreds of study from the medical field that show particular types of mindfulness interventions can have significant impact, not only on stress or burnout, but on um, improving immune function, on reducing um, conditions such as psoriasis. So I think that is important when we consider an intervention for a workplace or a program that we want to join to look at what type of mindfulness tools they use and if they use something that is supported by research evidence. I think it's important to have some rigor um, on that. Um, but also, yes, more overall, what I what I would like to report is that even though mindfulness is definitely not a panacea and, and mindfulness won't help you if you are living in a toxic environment um, and if you are working in a toxic environment, it can, however, help disengage uh, your fear response. It can help you protect yourself and your mental and physical well-being, um, and then hopefully make a make a make an informed decision from a place of power. That's an excellent summary. Thank you, Georgie. And I um, absolutely echo your views around um, you know any any interventions that organisations are implementing need to be grounded in evidence yeah, yeah. terrific uh, yes yeah uh georgia i got to say this has been the most comprehensive discussion i think we've had on the podcast around burnout mm. so it's uh been terrific having someone being able to explain these concepts so well mm. um so thank you so much for that thank you for having me yeah well we're still not finished yet so um we'd love to ask all of our guests this this question um what are your hopes for the future of workplace mental health? Oh, I actually, actually, I am very hopeful. You know, I think this is one of the, the I guess, the good things um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. One, uh, the fact that it's made mental health conversations more acceptable and the fact that um, it kind of forced us um, and many professions to, to have a view within you know, even this thing of Zoom, you're Zooming from home, you kind of have a, a view into your colleagues' personal environment. And and you see, you know, maybe they have young kids, they, you know. And so I am hopeful that this, uh, first of all, um, awareness and more normalization of mental health conversation continues, that there's less and less stigma around that. 
And I am also hopeful that regulators will pay more attention um, and I guess push forward the work that's already begun around, um, you know, creating more legal obligations for workplaces to look at psychosocial hazards and to protect their employees' mental well-being. So I think we're moving in the right direction, probably slower than we could, <laughs> but uh, I am nonetheless uh, quite hopeful because even, even just thinking back before the pandemic, um, we or at least I, I, I wasn't observing as many mental health conversations as we do now. Yeah, it's definitely been a good byproduct of the pandemic to uh, really raise the uh, focus around things like well-being and, and stress and um, burnout and mental health in the workplace. Um, definitely seeing um, this in Australia, at least, you know, we are moving in the right direction in terms of regulations and codes of practice. And um, we can see the regulators are arming up and starting to hire more and more um, mental health uh, professionals to come in and, and act as um, uh, inspectors. Yeah, so. yeah, and giving notices to organisations who aren't um, adequately controlling their, their risk. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely in Australia, um, yeah, the regulators are starting to get their act together in this space. And obviously they can do uh, with, obviously, with um, the codes of practice coming out now and, and um, the new regulations being drafted. They've got a lot more to go on. So, mm. yeah, I think it's heading in the right direction. And, and uh, unfortunately, it's taken uh, a stick to get some companies moving, but, you know, whatever it takes. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So, um, Georgie, do you have some words of advice that you'd like to share for uh, professionals who want to work in the field of psychological health and safety? Uh, just do it. I, <laughs> I would say this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's exciting to be in this space uh, because you're actually making um, a, a difference, right? You can, this is highly rewarding type of work. Um, so yeah, just go for it. And also it's good to be in it now where we're seeing a kind of a global movement um, that's that's supporting this. Um, so yeah, I think it's exciting. We also think it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we do it. No. Um, yeah, Georgie, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, it has been a very interesting and uh, exploratory discussion on burnout um, and you did it. Great credit today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the show, listeners. So don't forget, you can, if you'd like to watch these videos on the Flourish DX YouTube page, you can do that by heading over there um, at the day that the podcast is released. Um, also on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page, you'll notice that we put short clips uh, from these podcast episodes on there. So do follow the Flourish DX LinkedIn page if you want to get all of the best bits from the podcast in the short bite-sized segments. Um, while you're over on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with Joelle and myself. We love to continue the conversation uh, through that channel. And Georgie's pretty friendly too, as I found. So uh, feel free to um, reach out to her as well. Um, so that brings us to the end, listeners. We'll catch you next episode.